2018, the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League celebrated its 75th anniversary. I had the pleasure and the opportunity of attending a reunion and had the opportunity to meet many of the former players from the league as well as many others involved with the league in the preservation of its history. One of those individuals that I met at the event was an author who many years ago in her research compiled an all-time dream team lineup for the publication of her book. This book featured the greatest players by position. This is a great book to read about the history of the AAGPBL if you can find a copy, which is still pretty readily available as I was able to track down two copies before I attended the event. So, to continue to celebrate Women's History Month in the month of March, join me as I compile the greatest all-time All-American Girls Professional Baseball League Dream Team lineup. I will be doing this lineup similar to other lineups I have done in the past by putting each player in the batting order as if to play a real simulated game. Hopefully this presentation will give you, the viewer, a new look at the history of the greatest women to ever play in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League and open up the opportunity for you to learn even more about the history of the league through this presentation. Leading off and playing second base was four-time All-American Girls Professional Baseball League All-Star Sophie Curries. Nicknamed Tina Cobb in the Flint Flash being a Michigan native, Sophie was the all-time career leader in league history with a total of 1,114 stolen bases for her eight seasons in the league. In fact, in her top stolen base season, she stole a remarkable 201 bases in 203 attempts in 1946. When she retired from the game, she actually had the most stolen bases of any stolen base king until Ricky Henderson broke the stolen base total in his career. She had more stolen bases than Lou Brock, Ty Cobb, and the Japanese counterpart in the Japanese Professional Baseball League. During her career, Sophie stole a base 80% of the time she was on base. Standing at 5'5 five five and 120 pounds, Sophie was a very good contact hitter. She had the ability to get on base and even one season tied for the league lead in home runs. Sophie has the record for the most runs scored in a game, in a season, and for a career in the league. Her fielding skills also were phenomenal at second base as she has a .957 career fielding percentage, meaning she very rarely made an error. Sophie's superior base running ability and fielding ability makes her the perfect leadoff hitter and defensive acre for this all-time team. Batting second and playing third base is Betty Weaver Foss. Betty dubbed girls baseball's answer to the atom bomb because of her explosive power at the plate never batted under 321 in a season for her entire five-year career, finishing second all-time with a .342 career batting average. In her first season in 1950, she was named Rookie of the Year while winning her first of two batting titles. She only played her rookie season at third base before moving to first base. However, with a lineup that will feature another great first bagger, moving her back to third to keep her in the lineup is the most sensible thing to do. Betty is the record holder for most hits in a season, including the most doubles and triples in a season, showcasing her pure ability to hit as well as run the bases. She stole 294 bases in her five-year career, once stealing over 50 in a season, four of her five seasons playing. In total, Weaver Foss was one of the greatest hitters to ever play in the league, and no doubt only one part of the greatest trio of sisters to play in the league. As amazing of a player, Betty Weaver Foss was. Amazingly, her younger sister was just as great. Betty's younger sister, Joanne, makes the team as the third hitter and right fielder. Joanne Weaver was only one of two women to record a 2020 season in the league. It is amazing what Weaver did in just her four years in the league. The youngest of the league's Weaver sisters, Jolton Joe, standing at nearly six feet tall, won three straight batting titles from 1952 to 54. 
batting 344 in 1952, 346 in 1953, and a historical 429 in 1954. The only player to ever hit over 400 in the regular season. Yes, Joanne Weaver is the Rogers Hornsby of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, actually outdoing Hornsby for the highest batting average in a single season. She did not win the Triple Crown, however, in 1954, as Gene Gessinger had more RBIs that season. Joanne also stole 79 bases in 1954, showcasing her great base running ability. Because of her awesome offensive abilities and base running she, Weaver is probably one of the most feared people in this lineup, being in the number three hole. Batting fourth is Dottie Cammy Kamenchak, who holds the record for the most career hits in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. The left-handed hitting and throwing first baseman played her first year in the league in the outfield, but after only a few games was moved to first base where she would remain the rest of her career. A slick field in first baseman, Dottie had a career .950 fielding percentage. A feared hitter her entire career, she played a total of 10 years in the league, amassing 1,090 hits. Since its inception in the 1946 season, she made every all-star team that she played. She finished her career with the fourth highest career batting average at .292. In her 10-year career, she only struck out a total of 81 times, which is a measly sum of about 8 strikeouts in an entire season, which is amazing since one player can amass that many in a doubleheader in one day. In 1999, Sports Illustrated selected Dottie as one of the 100 greatest female athletes of the 20th century. She was the only baseball player to make this list. Because of the ability to make contact and rarely strike out as a lefty, Kamenchak is the perfect number four hitter in this lineup. Batting fifth is another switch hitter in the lineup and is the league's all-time home run leader. The only Canadian-born player to make this list, Eleanor Squirt Callow, was a switch hitting outfielder who spent eight total years in the league and amassed 55 career home runs. A perfect number five hitter because four of her eight seasons she led the league in triples and also scored 20 or more bases six of her eight seasons. Although she never hit more than eight home runs in a season prior to 1954, Eleanor had an absolutely dominating year in the league's final year in 1954 where she batted 326 and hit 20 home runs. Eleanor became one of two women ever to have a 2020 season along with number three hitter Joanne Weaver. Doris Sammy Sams is the first two-way star in the diamond to make the team. She excelled at being both a pitcher and outfielder for eight years in the league. As a fielder, she played both left and center field. At the plate, she had a career batting average of 290, although only playing part-time her rookie season as a fielder. Her second year in the league showed her skills at the plate bloom as she batted 280 and stole 41 bases. She had an impressive 11-4 record on the mound that year as well. She continued to pitch until the 1950 season, posting an overall record of 64 and 47 over five seasons on the mound, posting a 2.16 career ERA until playing full-time from 1950 to 53 as just an outfielder. She actually pitched a perfect game in 1947, being one of the very few pitchers to accomplish that feat in the league. Overall, a player like Sams is very important to have on this roster. She could play the field, hit very well, and if this team is in the pinch, come in as an effective relief pitcher. Batting 7th is left-handed hitting catcher Ruth Richard. At this point in the lineup, there's quite a significant drop in offensive numbers in the lineup. The excellent defensive skills and field leadership outweigh the offensive production. I will address a DH later in the video and would consider placing the DH batting 6th or 7th, essentially bumping Richard to the 8th hitter. In 1947, Richard started out as a rookie right fielder and relief pitcher for the Grand Rapids Chicks. The following year, she found herself on the now famous Rockford Peaches, where she was converted to a catcher. As a catcher for the Peaches, Richard was behind the plate from 1948 until the league ended in 1954. 
At the catching home, she caught the Peaches to four championships, appearing in the playoffs seven times, making the All-Star team six consecutive seasons. Although not a heavy hitter earlier in her career, she had a breakout in the final year of the league in 1954, batting 298 and belting seven home runs. The second Dottie to make the team is actually the only woman to play all 12 seasons in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. At just 15 years old, Dorothy Dottie Schroeder attended a tryout in St. Louis at Old Sportsman's Park. She was the youngest to try out and make the league and had to get permission from her parents to play. Early in her career, she struggled to play it and did not bat above 200 until 1949. Despite this, she was one of the best defensive players in the game and one of the most popular players. Her popularity soared as she appeared on the cover of Parade Magazine in 1948. Her trademark pick Dales and good looks made her a fan and media favorite. Her teammates all referred to her as a true gamer, and she was like a vacuum cleaner at shortstop. As she matured in age, also did her offensive skills, and in her final year in the league, still only in her mid-twenties, she batted 304 with 17 home runs and 65 runs batted in. When it was all said and done, Schroeder was the all-time leader in career games played, seasons played, at-bats, runs batted in, and only one of five women to have 400 or more for their career in RBIs. She was also the career leader in walks for the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. I felt she would be a perfect number eight hitter in this lineup to help ignite a flame when the game is on the line, batting in this spot of the order. One of the most difficult tasks was narrowing down the greatest pitcher in the league. There were multiple great pitchers that played in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Some may not realize that in the league they pitched both underhanded and overhanded until making the change in 1947 to sign armed or overhanded full-time delivery. The transition to overhand throwing was difficult for some and they were not able to be as effective after the switch. With this in mind, I chose to select two pitchers, one overhanded and the second underhanded as the all-time pitchers for this team. The overhanded pitcher selected for this team is Gene Fought. Fought debuted in 1946 as a sidearm relief pitcher and played third base. Her sidearm motion had to be approved because at this point the league only allowed underhanded pitching. In 1947 the league made the transition to overhanded and sidearm pitching and she won 19 games for the South Bend Blue Sox. In 1948 Fought threw her first no-hitter and in 1949 followed with a second note hitter in her highest winning season winning 24 games. Jean would follow her no hitter bids by throwing two perfect games in her career, being the only pitcher to accomplish this feat twice and one only four women to accomplish this feat in the league. One also being center fielder pitcher of this team, Dora Sams. Her most dominating year would be in 1952 when her record was 20 wins and two losses with a minuscule .93 ERA, leading South Bend to the championship and winning her first of two pitcher triple crowns. Ironically, despite this record and championship, she did not win the league's Player of the Year award that year, that she had won in the previous season in 1951 and would again win the award in 1953 with less wins in both years. In the end, Fout ended her career as one of the most, if not most, dominant pitchers in the league. Her career records include second all-time in wins and the lowest ERA for a career in league history. It should be noted, also, that on days Fout did not pitch, she also played the field. She struggled in her first season at the plate because she had never played softball and was not used to the underhanded delivery. After the league transitioned to overhanded, her offensive numbers increased throughout her career. So in the case of not having a DH on this team, Fout is the best selection as pitcher because of her dominance on the mound and as well as her ability to swing the bat. So with the next player selection, I hit two birds with one stone. Connie Iron Woman Wisniewski was a dominant underhanded pitcher before the transition to overhanded pitching. With Doris Sam starring in center field and as a pitcher, Connie, also an outfielder, would serve as the best underhanded pitcher, backup outfielder, and designated hitter for this team. In the case of Wisniewski, 
being used as the DH, it would alter the batting order slightly. Connie earned the nickname Iron Woman because of the amount of games she pitched on the mound earlier in her career. In 1944, she won 23 games. The following years were even better with her winning 32 games with a .81 earned run average in 1945, and in 1946 pitched in 40 complete games, never once being removed from a game, and winning 33 games. Their transition from underhanded to sidearmed was not smooth for Wisniewski. Although she won 16 games in 1947, she lost 14. By 1948, she became a part-time relief pitcher, and by 1949, she focused her attention on being a full-time left-handed hitting outfielder, despite throwing right-handed. As a hitter, she had a very respectable career and retired from the league after the 1952 season. Because of her versatility on the field, mound, and at the plate, Wisniewski is the perfect for the role of DH, pitcher, and backup outfielder on this team. I hope you have enjoyed this compilation of stars on the all-time All-American Girls Professional Baseball League Dream Team. One thing that I noticed while doing the research for this presentation was that many of the players were in the prime of their careers when the league folded in 1954. If the league would have existed any longer, many of the career numbers for these individuals would have been even higher. After the league folded in 1954, a traveling barnstorming team did tour the country from 1955 to 1958, playing and defeating many male teams throughout the country called the Allington All-Stars, which was managed by former All-American Girls Professional Baseball League manager Bill Allington. Perhaps I will do a follow-up video featuring this team in the near future. In closing, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. This was a difficult roster to compile because there were so many great players from the league to choose from. So you, the viewer, may disagree with some of my choices, but it was not my intention to forget anyone off of this team. My intention of this video was to preserve the history of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League and move forward in the 21st century educating everyone of the importance of female athletes in any sport, but most importantly, females in baseball. Thank you for joining me on this presentation. It was an honor to compile this list for you.